I run a children's charity, and we work in some of the poorest countries in the world. We do great work, work that I'm immensely proud of. And there are thousands of other organizations, like Justin's you heard about earlier, who also do great work. But it's not enough. We all know the world faces enormous challenges, whether it's poverty, disease, climate change, inequality, the list is long. And I'm going to take it for granted that I don't need to convince this audience that those are real problems and they affect real people. But thankfully, our governments agree. Last September, all 193 countries came together and they created the Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 global goals that every country has committed to achieving by 2030. And they're hugely ambitious goals. This is not reduce poverty, it's no poverty. It's not improve gender equality, it's gender equality in 15 years. Is that possible? Well, that's what I'm here to talk to you about. We need to find the key resource to make that happen, and that's money. Because the UN estimates that we need between five and $10 trillion every year between now and 2030 to make those global goals happen. But the good news is that at least we've acknowledged that these are solvable goals. Solvable if we as a society are willing to commit enough time, effort, and resource to doing so. The only missing ingredient is we don't really know where we're gonna get that five to 10 trillion from. But that's what I'm here to convince you that we can mobilize a substantial sector of our society. Five to $10 trillion equates to around 5% of the world's gross national income. That's the world's economies. That's what we need to find and direct to the smartest people with the most sophisticated technology and give them the freedom to really tackle these problems if we want to achieve these global goals. But who's going to do that, and where are they going to get that sort of money? Well, let's start with the who. Imagine if you had a group of experts who had been working on these problems for decades, trying different approaches, seeing what works, what doesn't. Well, we already have these people. We have a sector brimming with some of the smartest minds in the world, and they're capable, if they were given enough resources, of really delivering this sort of change. And that sector is the non-profit sector or the charity sector, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably. Well, you might ask, well, what about the private sector or government? Couldn't they tackle these problems? Well, let's start with the private sector. The private sector has one overriding goal, profit. And it works, it's an incredibly efficient mechanism. But it cares little for how it raises that profit, and it cares even less about how that profit is spent. Now, it is a tool that we must harness, as I'll explain later, but that profit agenda means it cannot be the implementing tool. So what about governments? Well, government's main priority is the interests of its people. And politicians have a political agenda, so short-term public opinion and electability is what drives them. Do we really believe that our politicians are going to shift our public spending to the point where 5% of our economies are directed to solving these problems? I don't think so. So that leaves us with this third sector, or non-profit sector. They are not driven by profit or votes. They care about social impact. And their goals are already these sustainable development goals. They've been the experts in those goals for a very long time. The non-profit sector might not be perfect, but it's best place to tackle these problems. And if so, how? How are we going to empower the non-profit sector to tackle these problems. How are we going to get them five to ten trillion dollars a year? Well, our instinctive initial reaction might be that we, as a society, should give more, because that's how we fund our nonprofits at the moment. But I think there's some real problems with this that make it unlikely to be the solution. Firstly, giving hasn't grown. Giving here in the UK has been at 0.8% of our gross national income for decades generations, flatline. And there's one big reason for that, and that's because we don't really understand our not-profit sector. There's a fundamental misperception about how it works, and it's hugely damaging. And that misperception is called the overhead myth. The overhead myth is the simple idea whereby a good or well-run non-profit or charity is one that has low admin costs or a small overhead. And that a bad, inefficient, 
nonprofit is one that has larger admin costs and a large overhead. Now, this is an idea that we as a society and a sector have been obsessed with. It's all you hear about, splashed across the front pages of the newspapers. Inefficient charities who take your donations and only spend a small amount of it on the cause. Or that they pay exor huge salaries to their employees and waste all your money. But this perception is fundamentally wrong. In fact, it's, it's slightly disingenuous. If you focus entirely on the admin costs, you neglect the outcomes. No one in this conversation is looking at what those nonprofits achieve. It's looking at their admin costs. And relevant to today's talk is if you focus on the overheads, you paralyze the nonprofit sector. It can't grow to the kind of scale it needs to be if it's going to tackle these problems that we've set it. Let me give you an example. So last year, we received thousands of donations from people who wanted us to help children. But thankfully, those donors also believed that we were the best people to decide how to do that. So we took 10,000 pounds of these donations. And we didn't spend them on projects in Africa helping children. We spent them on building a new fundraising product here in the UK. And that's Charity Concierge. It's a fairly simple concept. If you're at a music festival and you're watching a band, it's your turn to go and buy the drinks, but the queue's too long. You pay someone, a Charity Concierge, to go and get your drinks for you, and we keep the money. Now, what we did there is we took those 10,000 pounds of donations. And for each donor's pound, we spent 100% of that on admin costs. Now that is, would be vilified in the press, unscrupulous, shameful, scandalous, are all words that our national press here in the UK have used about nonprofits doing exactly this sort of thing recently. But because those donors trusted us, we turned that 10,000 pounds into 35,000 pounds. And this year, 150,000 pounds. And that's now 150,000 pounds every year that we can use to help children. I know we spend that money better by spending on admin costs than had we spent it directly helping children. And this irrationality of the overhead myth becomes even more apparent once you apply its strange structure to the private sector. Let's take Apple or Google or any of the large private co sector companies. They run on around a 20% profit ratio, which means that they have admin costs of 80%, which would be unacceptable for a nonprofit. But why? So let's stick with Apple. It has a revenue of around $50 billion a year and a profit of around $10 billion a year. Now imagine if all the shareholders of Apple decided that tomorrow, Apple would still build computers and still sell computers, but it would become a non-profit and all the proceeds would go directly to cancer research. Well, first of all, that would be a wonderful thing. But bizarrely, in people's eyes, Apple would go from being one of the most lauded efficient, effective, successful companies in the world overnight to being viewed as one of the world's worst non-profits. And that's because of the revenues, 80% is admin costs, and 20% goes to the cause, that phrase that we hear so often. Now, that doesn't make sense to me, that that would be a bad non-profit. Never mind that $10 billion a year is more than the global non-profit spend on cancer research, many times over. It doesn't make sense to me, and I don't think it would make sense to people affected by cancer either. So we need to move away from the overhead myth. We need to release non-profits from this paralyzing analysis of their admin costs versus profits. But because of that, we need a cultural shift, one that I think is gonna take time, too much time, time we don't have, which is why I don't think we can grow the giving enough to get us from 0.8% of our economies to 5% of our economies, which is what the nonprofit sector would need to achieve those global goals. So what do we do? I think we need to move beyond giving. To explain what I mean, if we take our economies as a whole, and for simplicity's sake, we split it into three things, giving, taxes, and spending. Now giving, I've already explained, I don't think it's gonna get us to the 5%. So what about taxes? People don't like to be taxed. It's not gonna happen. So that simply leaves us with spending. By spending, what I mean is the, the money that we spend buying things, the private sector. Here in the UK, it makes about 65% of our economy. And that's where I think we're gonna find this 5%. People don't wanna stop buying things. So let's not make them. 
All we need to do is take 5% of the profit from the money they're spending anyway and shift it from shareholders to the non-profit sector and we can achieve those global goals. 5% of the 65% is all we need to move. So how do we do that? Well, non-profits need to start thinking like businesses. They need to start building businesses but that are owned by a non-profit. And they don't need to be directly related to the cause. Why should they? They're just there to make money. And to explain this, I'm going to talk through a massive missed opportunity for the non-profit sector. And that's sports challenge events. You might think of these as a success because they make a fundamental part of non-profit funding at the moment. But actually, there's a massive missed opportunity. So the leading experts over the last 30 years at delivering large-scale sports events have been the non-profit sector. Think of all the runs, cycles, walks, hikes. They do them really, really well. And millions of people take part in them. But to take part in a non-profit sports event, you have to fundraise through sponsorship. Now, they do this in order to keep that crazy profit admin to cost ratio. So how this works is it costs X amount per person to, take, to, create, to run the event. They pay a ticket that covers the costs, and then they fundraise on top. And they might raise, say, 200 pounds per person. Now, that's amazing. That's a 200 pound profit. Sounds brilliant. But actually, the number of people willing to fundraise, as a proportion of the people willing to take part in a, fun, in a sports challenge event, are really quite small. So there's this, all these other people who'd be willing to do an event, but who don't, because they don't want to fundraise. And what happens? Along comes an organization like Tough Mudder. Nothing wrong with what they've done. They've seen a market opportunity. They're a private sector company. And what they did was develop a sports challenge event very similar to the one that nonprofits have been doing for ages. It's a half marathon obstacle course. But the difference is you don't have to fundraise. You just pay a little bit more for your ticket. So instead of making 200 pounds per person, they only make 20 pounds per person. But it's about scale. Two million participants later, and Tough Mudder makes about 100 million pounds a year. And that was 100 million pounds that the nonprofit sector could have captured easily. It's no different from anything else they've been delivering. But they couldn't because of the admin costs, because of the overhead myth. Nonprofits can't run events where you only make 20 pounds per person. Why not? 100 million pounds is worth high admin costs. So you might think that that was an easy one because it was something that nonprofits knew about. And how would nonprofits compete if they had to go head to head against the private sector, the cut and thrust of the competitive private sector? Well, I think there's lots of good reasons why nonprofits would be just as good, if not better, than the private sector. But I'll leave you with one. But it's an important one. And that's that nonprofits have an inbuilt competitive advantage. The cause. If all else is equal and you have two products, the profits from buying this product go to solving the world's problems. The profits from buying this product go to making someone else richer. Solving the world's problems will win. And some of you might be skeptical and think that I'm relying on people's goodwill and that when it comes to purchasing decisions, people, people don't like helping others because they're inherently selfish. Well, firstly, I'm probably a little bit less of a cynic than you, but the beauty of this competitive advantage is that it's a selfish one. The profits of buying a non-profit product are likely to go to something that benefits you. In game theory, you might describe it as a positive sum game for you to be involved with. Or in plainer English, it's a win-win. You get the product, but also the profits from that product are likely to be spent on something that might benefit you, like cancer research. So, it is possible for the nonprofit sector to take market share from the private sector. As soon as we remove the irrationality of the overhead myth, the competitive benefits or advantages of the nonprofit sector emerge. Industries could be disrupted, huge profits made, and those would be directed to achieving these sustainable development goals. Imagine if 5% or 10% of the money, of the profits from the money that we all spend anyway were put to tackling the world's toughest problems. No poverty, no hunger, halting climate change. What sort of a world would that be? So nonprofits need to start thinking like businesses. Now that's something that I, as a chief executive of one, can do. But you, 
all of you, need to help us move beyond giving. Now don't, for one second, think that I'm asking any of you to stop giving. In fact, <laughs> give twice as much, but don't, don't choose your nonprofit based on their admin costs. Choose them based on their ambition. Choose them based on what they are going to achieve. Choose them based on their willingness to build. Demand that your donation is used to invest, because without scaling and growing our nonprofit sector, we're not going to achieve these goals. Help us move beyond giving. Thank you very much.